Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to episode 311 of the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Polar's world-leading GPS multi-sport and running watches and their heart rate monitors. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. Of course, we do this across a range of different episodes, interest editions, coaches' corners, learning to catch episodes, feature performers, and the very popular, as always, expert editions. And on today's episode, episode 311, we've invited back our good friends from Bartold Clinical, acclaimed sports podiatrist Simon Bartold, and fellow sports podiatrist Paul Griffin. Now, if you've been tuning in to the Physical Performance Show for several years, you will know the gentlemen. They've featured several times on episode 153 back in March 2019, where the gentlemen shared a running shoe masterclass. And then again, episode 205 in March 2020, where the theme to explore on that expert edition was carbon plated shoe technology. Now, 12 months on, We've invited the gentleman back to share around the top five running shoe innovations of the last 20 years. We've all been privy to the incredible advances in running shoe technologies over the last two decades. So some of the top five innovations will be of no surprise, but I assure you there will be a surprise or two in this top five. By way of brief bio, Dr. Paul Griffin, sports podiatrist, has a sports podiatry career spanning 25 plus years. Paul has provided services to the Perth Glory Football Club and the Western Australian branch of the Australian Podiatry Council. Paul's Bartold clinical colleague, Simon Bartold, likewise has had a very impressive career. Across Simon's career to date, he's been the consultant at the Australian Institute of Sport Cricket Academy, the British Cricket Academy and the Indian Cricket Team. Simon was a Deputy Director of Podiatry Services at the Sydney Olympic Games in 2000 and then again for medical teams at the 2004 and 2008 Olympic Games. Simon went on to attend his fourth Olympic Games in London in 2012, followed by a stint as consultant podiatrist to Port Power in the AFL, alongside being an editorial board member for the Journal of Science and Medicine in Sport and the Australasian Physiotherapy Journal. Simon's involvement in shoe innovations and technologies is rivaled by few others, so enjoy this expert edition exploring the top five running shoe innovations over the last 20 years. Simon Bartold and Paul Griffin, it's been a little while. It was back on episode 205 in March 2020 that you last both featured as our resident footwear experts uh, when we discussed the technology of carbon-plated shoes. So welcome back to the Physical Performance Show. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Brad. Bit of water under the bridge since, since March 2020. The, world, the world's gotten a little bit more complex, a little bit like uh, footwear science. Certainly has. <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, you're always a wealth of experience when it comes to all things footwear. And recently, a Bartold Clinical Instagram series of posts caught my eye, and that was this uh, five, a challenge from, from yourself, Paul, to Simon, I believe, to condense decades of uh, industry experience into uh, coming up with a list of the top five running shoe innovations over the last two decades. And, and that's the topic of our conversation today. But before we actually talk about these innovations, Paul, what was the driving force to lay down such a challenge? Thanks, Brad. I think um, I think you nailed it uh, in just in, in exactly what you said there. Uh, Simon and I have, have regular conversations um, amongst our, our business meetings, but also in general as to where things have, have gone right and where things have gone wrong. Uh, we're, we're on the, in the footwear innovation side of things. So it's a uh, 
I, I guess, drawing on uh, experience in both clinical practice and biomechanics and uh, materials innovation and general industry knowledge, um, consumer insights, et cetera, that we, we often have these conversations surrounding what are what are the best innovations. I said to Simon, what a great opportunity over a course of a period of time to drop um, the top five innovations over the past 20 years. And the past 20 years is a, is a fantastic snapshot because there has been so much change, especially in technology, material science, uh, the emergence of the internet, um, you know, uh, different retail pathways, different concepts and the barefoot thing, everything gets mixed up into this big pot of uh, different paradigms and uh, Simon's uh, lived through it all. And uh, as, as head of uh, research for ASICS for quite some time, Simon can elaborate on that, but it was great to, to put that challenge to him and, and uh, have him bring forward his, his top five innovations in athletic footwear in the last 20 years. What I actually heard, Brad, was, Simon, I don't like you at all. I'm going to make your life really difficult. That's pretty much what I heard. <laughs> so it was like choosing your favourite children, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. As you mentioned there, Paul, there has been so much change, and I think any any runner, any footwear purchaser out there will at times ongoing be confused with the different innovations in many ways. So let's talk through these top five innovations as nominated by Simon Bartold. The first one was the hollow corn runner, uh, and you commented at Bartold Clinical, we will continue to champion champion material science innovation and support the companies prepared to invest in a better future for performance. So what was the what was the rationale for nominating the Hilo Corn Runner as the top innovation in the last 20 years? Um, well, I'll give you the backstory on that, Brad, which I think maybe listeners may not be aware of. But um, as you know, I, I worked in France for four and a half years with a company called Salomon and on their road running development program. And Salomon make about 10 million pairs of shoes a year. And the carbon footprint of 10 million shoes a year is enough to power the city that both Paul and I lived in called ANSI for one year. Now, Nike, on the other hand, only make 25 pairs of shoes, but they make them every second of every minute of every day, 365 days a year, almost a billion pairs of shoes. And the carbon footprint of that will power New York City for a year. And you've then got to factor in that any one point in time, there are about half a billion pairs of shoes lying on beaches in the ocean everywhere, and they simply don't go away. So the industry has created a huge issue for us all and Paul and I are really pretty passionate about this. We, you know, we look at it and recoil from it as everybody should. There are many, many issues with wastage and, and the materials that are used and glues and all sorts of stuff. So <clears throat> the reason I chose Hilo uh, and, and when Paul sent me this challenge, I didn't want to think about necessarily popular choices. I wanted to think about the companies that I really thought were innovators or had produced truly innovative product. Hilo is quite unusual in that their focus has been quite different to any other footwear company. They're, they're not looking at recycling. They're looking at biodegradability. Recycling doesn't solve the problem. It just recycles it. The product's still there. It still will end up somewhere. Whereas biodegradability means it will go away. Um, it means that it will, it will dissolve. So whilst they've not completely cracked that nut, I believe more than any other footwear company that's building running shoes, they're, they're, they're a lot further down the track than any other company um, because of the materials they use, because of their lack of glues, and because of their processes, their manufacturing processes, they're way ahead of the curve. And in particular, the materials they're using like corn starches, potato starches, all sorts of different things, these are materials that actually will go away. They, they will actually dissolve over a period of time and quite a short period of time. We know that uh, with traditional manufacturing, the materials that are used in running shoes will last for 200 years plus. That's how long they'll stick around for. Um, so we've got a very obvious issue um, staring us right in the face. So that's why I gave that particular company and that shoe uh, the number one spot because I just thought it was the most important development in the last 20 years. Well, when I saw that go live on the Instagram gallery, Bartod Clinical, I was initially surprised, but now I understand more. It's it's a, an environmental slash social responsibility trophy that they're taking out there. Uh, and 
when you mentioned the number of shoes that lay on beaches, I think anyone that's travelled or had the opportunity to travel sometimes to off the map destinations, you do always see shoes laying around somewhere. And and I did exactly what you just said people do. And I recoiled when you said that number. I'm like, oh gosh, it's kind of convenient to forget that that's what happens to them. Yeah, it really is, and it's you know anybody who's been to Bali and has um, you know gone to that uncharted territory, which is the beach, the other side of the resort, you will see all those shoes piled up there that haven't been cleaned off the beach, and it, it is quite shocking and quite confronting. It, it's a looming, if not already a disaster, it's a looming disaster. I mean, I'm sure Paul's got some thoughts on it as well because he's also quite quite passionate about this issue. Yeah, thanks, Simon. I think it's um, we can talk a, a quite a long time about sustainability and, and ESG components of where companies, but this this movement is really driven by the consumer. Um, you know, they're, they're becoming more aware. Fast fashion is is front and centre, but um, look, uh, uh, there's two two pathways in sustainable footwear that we need to educate people on, especially users of footwear products, and that is that. Basically, every pair of running shoes has about 14 kilograms of carbon. Uh, you know, it's responsible for 14 kilograms of carbon by the time it reaches a consumer's hands. So there's there's two pathways that you take with sustainability. The first pathway is materials and material science, which Simon touched on. And the second pathway is how can we reduce the amount of carbon to produce the, the will get the shoes to the consumer. Um, so with the materials, there's obviously uh, environmental or nature-based products. Uh, there's a, there's, they talk about the three R's being repair, reuse and recycle. And we're transitioning to those new materials, but also on the carbon side of things, we need to be really wary that that 14 to 15 kilos of carbon per pair of running shoes, um, high low are now sitting at exactly 7.84 kilograms of carbon when it reaches a consumer. And they can even break that down to their materials being responsible for 4.5 kilograms of carbon, uh, the manufacturing process 1.5 kilos, transport 0.77, uh, end of life 0.23. So you can see that it's almost like when you pick up a, um, a cereal box and you can see the breakdown of contents and ingredients. Well, we're starting to do that with footwear because consumers are starting to value uh, their their responsibility in purchasing environmental uh, environmentally friendly products um, over the top. I won't say over the top, but on a level of innovation, they rate that as important as performance or their own personal attrib- uh, their own personal agenda to, to for personal best, etc. You know, in the last five years, every major company. So think about your Nikes, your Addies, your um, your Asics, your Brooks. All those companies are structured into divisions. So you know, you'll have your designers, you'll have your developers, you'll have marketing, you'll have commercial, etc. Each one of those brands now has a complete division on sustainability. So they're taking it very, very, very seriously. And um, I think there are so many things that people may not understand, not just in terms of the breakdown, but the toxicity that's involved. So you, we also know that some of the stuff that's leaching out of these shoes is having a major biodiversity effect. To give you an example, the foams that are used, they all use a toxic foaming agent. So in other words, to get the foam to expand, they introduce a chemical and that's what makes the foam expand. We're in a brave new world here, fortunately, in that we we have new things called supercritical foams that don't use a foaming agent at all. So they're far more environmentally friendly and far less toxic. So we're we're on the upward curve here, but you know, I do I do really tip my hat to Hilo that they 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 made that their their major priority, and and so that's why they got the gong. And if uh, if uh, listeners out there are thinking this is a, a small scene, all birds were one of the first to start with sustainable footwear in, I think, 2016. They were given a grant by the New Zealand government for 115,000 pairs, uh, for, for $115,000. They started with a, a small batch of sample pairs. They Two months ago, they listed on the NASDAQ at a valuation of $4 billion. Yeah, they're the footwear equivalent equivalent of cryptocurrency. They <laughs> are. What was that brand again? Sorry, gentlemen. Uh, All Birds. All Birds. Uh, started by, uh, was it Tim, who used to play A-League for Wellington Phoenix, and uh, uh, Joey Zilweger, who's a, an American, West Coast American venture capitalist. And so for the listener of the show who is now feeling a burden to assist uh, in some way uh, rather than just consume, what can we practically do? Is it just wait for the manufacturers to improve their material sciences and et cetera, or is it is there anything else? Look for these brands or any advice? Yeah, I think, I think definitely look for these brands. So um, 
that, you know, right now we should be honest and say, look, there probably will be um, there probably will be a performance um, penalty uh, for going with some of these brands, or maybe a durability penalty. Uh, not so much a performance penalty, actually, but definitely a durability penalty. But I think you know all the major brands. Um, Adidas have already introduced some stuff. Salomon have introduced a a, a, recy- a completely recyclable shoe. But from my perspective, uh, it's argumentative. I, I'm far more interested in the biodegradable as- aspect than the recycling aspect because I just don't think that that solves the problem. I um, mean, it kind it slows it down definitely, and it's definitely um, a step in the right direction. But I think what we need to focus on is actually making it go away. You know, use potato starch when the shoe's dead, bury it in the ground, potato will grow, use that spud to build another shoe. You know, that's that's the way we should be thinking about it. Gosh, uh, Daniel Ricciardo uh, might have uh, more use for his uh, shoes than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's definitely not been drinking much champagne out of them recently. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, uh, so that was the top innovation as nominated by Simon Bartold over the last two decades. The second most significant innovation, probably no surprise, was the Nike Vaporfly 4% fly knit. You commented, gentlemen, I've worked in the industry or Simon for more than 30 years and innovation and technology have always played a role in ultimate performance. It is of little surprise that I'm naming the Nike Vaporfly 4% the second most important in this series. So no surprises there. You'd have to be sort of stuck under a rock to not actually look at this and, and, and understand the innovation that's gone into this shoe. So it's it's absolutely unprecedented in the history of running footwear. The, the shoe or one of the family of shoes holds every world record from 10,000 metres to the marathon in both men's and women's with the exception of the men's half marathon record. That's just off the chart when, when we first saw this shoe come out brad in 2016 everybody's saying oh you know it's a you know it's marketing it's typical nike marketing but here we are in 2021 and all of the data is saying the same thing it's saying that the shoe offers somewhere between a four to eight percent energetic advantage which is somewhere between a two to four percent time advantage two to four percent time advantage for an elite is just you know a massive difference and um I think it's one of the interesting things is that we, we're five years down the track and uh, whilst we've seen a few blips in the radar, especially with the, Adi- the Adios, Adidas Adios Pro, Nike is still way ahead of the curve. I mean, the, the, the competitors have just not caught up to them. And, and we could put forward all sorts of reasons for that. We could say, well, they've got the best athletes, which they do, but you've still got to be able to run in the shoe and you've got to be able to exploit the shoe. And um, that's why I, I put it in at number number two. I just uh, It's just... You know, I, I considered putting it number one because, just because of what it's done, but it is truly innovative and they were the first guys to do it. And, they're, uh, you know, it's scary to think what they might be working on now because they're, they're working on product for 2023, 2024, and, uh, you know, be very, very interesting to be a fly on the wall in, in Beaverton, you know, in Oregon to, to know what they're doing. Paul, uh, is there any irony in talking about reducing carbon footprints and then... Uh... Talking about carbon plated shoes for the, for the next next innovation. <laughs> well, there was there was a discussion surrounding the um, the vapor fly four percent recently and how uh, the P backs midsole because of its superior nature, uh, performance nature. There's there's not not uh, any other material that rivals it. So you know, really, the vapor fly a, a, a marvelous performance innovation. It has sustainability issues surrounding that because it's really quite disposable once the PBAX loses its mojo. Uh, one thing that they were talking about on uh, Future World, which is a uh, sustainability, a footwear sustainability uh, blog, uh, was basically you know trying to somehow reuse the uppers of the Vaporfly, which which seemed to long outlast the um, the midsole, uh, PBAC's midsole, and they were looking at ways in which they could repair and reuse uh, to, to focus on different parts of the shoe so that obviously, um, you know, uh, less, less materials being being wasted. It's very interesting that one of the shoes that nearly made the cut <clears throat> is the new trail running shoe by Speedland. It's a new brand. They only have one product, um, and it's a trail running shoe that retails for about 370 US dollars. One of the really interesting things about that shoe is it has a removable, reusable carbon plate. So you, you basically, when the shoe's done, you just whip it out and give it back to them, and they'll put it back in another shoe. 
Um, and the carbon plate, I mean, I, I, I don't know how long it would take a carbon plate to degrade, if ever, but I'm assuming it would be thousands of years. Gosh. And the PBAX foam, what's the biodegrad- biodegradability of that like, or is it a real problem? It's a real problem. Yeah, it's a real problem, but they have got um, the capabilities to shred these foams and then uh, basically bag into three different grades uh, and then bag these uh, foams up and send them back to China to make more insoles or midsoles. And I think that's probably the way we're going uh, in, the, in the near term as an interim until we innovate enough with the material science that we can have a performance foam that that um, makes all our dreams come true. One of the issues with PBAX, it's a fantastic material, but it's it's its real name is polyethyl block, block amide. And it basically the, the the beauty of this material is that you can you can go into the kitchen and you can change the recipe because it consists of two different molecules and you can you can weight the you can weight the structure of it. So you can either make it very very hard like the sort of thing you'd use on a footy boot outsole or you can make it in something like Zoom X, which is what what uh, Nike have put in in their, their high end product. If you've put it in that product, you can't you can't restructure it. Once it's foam, it's foam. You can't turn it back to a hard plastic. So you can only repurpose it for its original purpose, and and so that really limits its ability somewhat. I think. Obviously, we'd expect that the sustainability will, will be a focus for Nike going forwards as well. As you shared, every brand is now investing in that. Yeah, I think um, the big brands have definitely got the money to spend on sustainability, but where they fall over uh, is they're just so big that they just can't turn to reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, they can innovate in material science, but I think the more nimble guys like the Allbirds and the high lows of the world will um, will basically attract the interest of the the pure hearted consumer because their 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 company moral is built off sustainability, not off um, other other things such as performance. So, which is why you saw Adidas do a collaboration with Allbirds last year. They got a shoe out which was I think two point five kilograms of carbon in the collaboration, which is a fantastic effort. And I think, Brad, what it comes down to at the moment and Nike and the Addies and the Pumas and the huge, the, the big players, they've got the ability to educate. And I think like even via this podcast, um, we're talking about a performance shoe with 4% and and we've rotated that conversation around how can we turn this into a sustainability story. And that's what we need to do. We need to talk about it more and educate people, the consumers, the people that use it. Not that we want this podcast to turn into a sustainability discussion, but it is an important factor. There are a lot of things happening here that muddy the water a bit. So there are, there are a lot of moving parts to building a shoe and, and one of the most important is the factory. So a company like Nike can have, you know, a large department that's looking at sustainability, but if they can't convert that discussion to what the factory is doing, then it's impossible to build sustainable product. So right now, if we football boots as an example, um, most football boots are made with synthetic uppers, which are dreadful, um, you know, highly non-sustainable. You've got materials now that are that are plant-based, so, so made entirely out of plants that are of the same quality as kangaroo leather, considered the, the best quality leather you can have. That are completely biodegradable. They, they disappear. But if the factory is not set up to do that, or if the factory doesn't want to do that, or if the factory requires a certain number, a certain um, uh, quota, a certain numbers of shoes to be built, it just won't happen. There are many parts of the jigsaw that need to come together before we we get to a better solution for footwear. On the carbon plated shoes, we touched on the injury profile uh, associated with their use back nearly two years ago. Anything you'd both add to that conversation point two years on with uh, this technology advancement? We're two years down the track and we've not seen any compelling data to say that, the sh- that there's any any major negative effect to the footwear. But I had a really interesting chat with Ben O'Neill not that long ago and, and, and he made a very interesting point about both the, far, the foams and the carbon fibre plate. And he said, you know, the issue with this is that everybody responds differently to the shoe and for the shoe to work properly, Everything has to come together. So basically where you strike, how you strike, where the foam is positioned, where the carbon fibre plate is positioned, all have to interact correctly with the athlete. And that's why we see these responders versus non-responders. So it is quite important to put on the table that these shoes are not for everyone. Um, In terms of injury, what we have seen recently is um, a couple of papers that have suggested not only the the performance benefit of this type of shoe but also 
there's uh, been quite a good study by a fellow called um, Brett uh, Kelly uh, out of the USA, out of Nike, but but working independently, that was able to show fairly conclusively that that the Vaporfly 4% reduces DOMS. Um, so therefore, the athlete can train harder and longer without getting the uh, you know sort of the downside after that training, which is pretty interesting. So it's the opposite of injury. It's basically saying, well, you can go a bit harder with these shoes. So, but I've not seen anything really coming through that's saying saying there's a major risk associated with the footwear. Certainly, anecdotally, I've heard a few runners or quite a few runners mention that they feel they can use them in their long runs and not pull up as sore. So. Maybe that matches the science there. Paul, anything you'd add? Uh, no, Simon's the, the the brains trust in that department and um, he, he reflects those types of uh, opinions to me. But I have heard anecdotally um, early days that uh, a few of the, the guys in the training squads here were were isolating uh, tibial, tibialis posterior as, a, as you know, uh, as their little beef. But uh, I don't, you know, see anything in the evidence or in my discussions with Simon surrounding that uh, there is anything specific. But like with anything, um, you get a new toy and you use it a lot, you know, there's always that risk. You're listening to Simon Bartold and Paul Griffin of Bartold Clinical sharing their top five running shoe innovations over the last 20 years on this expert edition. Support for today's show is lovingly brought to you by Polar's world-leading GPS multi-sport and running watches, also their heart rate monitors. Coming from the heart of the Nordics and with over 40 years of proven performance, Polar believe it all starts with heart. Their products simply give you the most accurate way to plan, train, and recover. Their Precision Prime heart rate technology is the most accurate way to plan and track your activity and recovery 24-7, 365. Polar's Training Load Insights allow you to explore the limit of your body so you can find out if you are training just right to improve your performance and reduce injury. And with Nightly Recharge, you can truly understand and predict your recovery so that you can not only own the night, but win the day. And who doesn't want that? So if you feel like it's time to beat your best, jump over to shop at Polar, polar polar.com, and check out their all-new range. Support for today's show also comes from Precision Hydration. Precision Hydration are doing for fueling what they've done for hydration. After years of helping athletes refine their hydration strategies for training and racing, the team at PH are also focusing on helping you nail your fueling strategy. Precision Fuel and Hydration's educational tools include their Quick Carb Calculator, which make it easy for you to understand how much carbohydrate you need to consume to perform at your best. Once you know your numbers, their precision fuel product range can make it easier and more efficient to get enough carbohydrate on board. As well as hydration, you're going to need to consider what you're going to eat to fuel your race. And precision hydration have made it easy to understand how much carbohydrate you need to consume to be at your best. Be sure to check out the Precision Fuel 30 Gels and Precision Fuel 30 Drink Mixes with each product containing 30 grams of carbohydrate per serving. Now, as a listener of the show, you can receive 15% off your first order of fueling and hydration products by using the code TPPS22 at the checkout at precisionfuelandhydration.com. That's TPPS22, all capitals, at the checkout at Precision Fuel and hydration.com. For now, let's jump back with this week's expert edition featuring the Bartold clinical team sharing around the top five running shoe innovations over the last 20 years. The third greatest innovation uh, as nominated uh, for Bartold clinical, no surprise that this made the the top five list, uh, was a shoe that, or a range of shoes when they first emerged I thought looked absolutely absurd and wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't stand the test of time. But here they are, major market players, and that's obviously Hoke One One. And specifically, uh, you've nominated Simon the Hoke One One Bondi, and you commented here that um, see the progress of their ugly shoe design, which looked like it was destined to go straight to footwear hell, but has exploded. <laughs> that was quite good, wasn't it? Um, <clears throat> it was brilliant. Uh, yeah, well, look, I mean, like I said, when they got bought out by Sketches in 2013, whoever whoever executed that buyout 
should have a should have a million dollar bonus because they went from, you know, they they thought if they got lucky they might they might become a hundred million dollar US company. They're about to become a one billion dollar US company. So they're by, they're by far the hottest brand in the world right now, and, I, and I'm talking across any brand, including Nike. They they are by far the hottest brand. And um, I, look, I, again, I guess Paul and I love love companies that take a chance. So w- we like to see people who are thinking outside the box and who will take a chance. And um, I think Hoka really did that. You know, they especially Brad when this was happening. This was happening right in the middle of the minimalist movement. You know. And everybody's running barefoot and running in their vibrant five fingers. And Hoka have come along and said, "All right, I'll try our shoes." You know, they've got a uh, they've got a, a 35, 35, 31 stack with a four mil drop, and uh, you know they're massive. Give it a whirl. But um, I think it's been interesting where they they you know they started with the ultra marathon runners, and it, it would make sense that those guys were getting some benefit out of it because of the massive rocker in the shoe. So the rocker allowed them to be a little less fatigued because it's, you know, it's a model of perpetual movement, basically. And the huge foams also protect them. I mean, these guys were getting hemolysis. They were running so far, you know, the leader for 100, 160 kilometres. They're getting red, red blood cell um, count changes because they're killing all their red blood cells because they're pounding their feet so much. So, um, yeah, I think it, it was just a very interesting idea from a couple of guys who were very keen to really push performance boundaries. They were adventure runners out of France. They wanted to try to understand how they could run down mountains faster. They were interested in oversized sporting goods like um, oversized um, mountain bike tyres, oversized tennis rackets, interested in snow ski technology, in geometry and curvature. And look, honestly, they've completely nailed it. Um, it stood. It, they're not without their issues, but they've stood the test of time. And so they they really are true innovators. What issues are there, Simon? You just mentioned not without their issues. Uh, there's quite a bit of data on um, uh, on on the shoes in terms of the cushioning, um, which obviously affects things like lower limb stiffness and p- potentially cu- too much cushioning can be a bad thing. Um, so that's that's the primary argument with the shoes. But when I say a lot, I mean I'm talking maybe maybe in all of the chatter, maybe a dozen papers that have thrown up a couple of negatives. So by by far the majority of information on them is positive. But but I think that's just something people should be aware of. That again, Brad, it's you know what suits the individual runner. Um, and it, you know anecdotally for Paul and I, you know, and you guys who've been in clinical practice. There was a bit of an inkling a few years ago that these shoes might work really well for broken down old runners who had recalcitrant issues. Um, whack them in a hoka because you had no better ideas and suddenly they're running again. Um, you know, very anecdotal, no science behind it at all. But that got a real groundswell. And you, you speak to most clinicians and they say that really is the case, um, you know, because of the rocker, because there is some protection. So they're the responders. They're the people who are working really well with this shoe. But other people, you know, it's not going to suit them all that well. I, I, I have noted that Hoka are actually doing quite well in some of the um, the big marathons this year. So, you know, there there is some performance aspect to them as well. They've got two carbon fibre plated shoes and uh, they're they're on a flyer. The perception certainly was when they arrived, as you say, Simon. Clinically, I observe this that. As you say, if you've been battling with injuries, get more stack height under your foot and it can only be a good thing. And uh, I think that perception in the marketplace is still out there. You did mention, though, that cushioning can be, too much cushioning can be a bad thing. Can you explain the biomechanics around the effect of cushioning and lower limb stiffness and how that can at times be potentially a negative? Sure. Yeah, well, everything we do when we run is controlled by our brain, basically. So the brain monitors everything at about 50 millisecond intervals. So every step of every run is monitored. And basically, if you go from bitumen to grass, your brain is going to register that you've gone from a hard surface to a soft surface. And when you step onto the grass, it is going to change the muscle activity to model your lower limb. 
as a stiffer spring. So it'll literally make your legs stiffer because you're on a softer surface. If the reverse is true and you go from grass to bitumen, it's going to say, oi, that's harder. I need a bit more compliance. I need a bit more spring occurring here. So it will change muscle activity. It will allow more knee flexion. It'll allow more subtalar joint pronation. So you've got more spring associated with that. Now, when you put big foams under the under the foot, um, you can get some real interference with, with, with that uh, transmission of the signal to the brain. So it's not really proprioception, it's a bit more complex than that, but um, it's, it certainly can interfere with that whole process and, and you get a bit of a confused signal occurring. And that's when you don't get this modulation of the lower limb uh, spring stiffness. And so that th- there is a bit of a direct line to injury associated with that. So that's what we have to be a bit careful of. Any injuries in particular? Uh, I, I've not read any, uh, th- no. These studies generally talk about RRI, running-related injury. So they're very careful not to sort of um, pinpoint any one injury at all. But the other thing we do know about, you'd be aware with stack heights and drops, is that uh, Hoka surprisingly has a massive stack but a very low drop, so they're mostly on a four or five millimetre drop, which is considered quite low. So we do know that when you go to that lower drop, you decrease the external knee joint moments, but you increase the external ankle joint moments. So things like the plantar fascia and the Achilles tendon, we would think would be slightly more exposed to injury, um, whereas the knee would be less exposed to injury. And that's where the smart clinicians, they can exploit that. It's neither good nor bad. It's just a fact. And if you understand it, then you can make changes accordingly. If you have somebody who's you know, a 15-year-old girl who's got injury knee pain that just won't go away, it's completely sensible to put them on a lower drop shoe. Um, that, that, that makes sense. But you'd have to monitor what was going on at the Achilles tendon um, because you may be increasing the load there. So I think that's probably the way we'd look at it. Paul, anything you'd add to Simon's comments there about Hoka One One and Maximalist shoes, specifically the Bondi? No, fascinating working with Simon, as you've probably uh, got a snapshot of of, uh, of the information that pops out from here and there. But the, the, the one thing that really interested me with the, the hocker and the emergence of it was, um, you know, most people had, like Simon said, most people had their head stuck in the book Born to Run. And um, they really were trying to work their way around conventional, inverted commas, conventional footwear. And you know, shoes. There was a, there was a very very much a vanilla landscape in footwear um, along the lines of you know everything kind of looked the same. It was just mar- it was a marketing war, um, and you know um, you know the the adrenaline, the Kayano and these types were, were essentially the Holden Commodores of the footwear industry. They just come up with a different name, different different badge every year, and whatever else. It was pretty much the same thing, and. And I think Hoke uh, really, uh, their innovation was really groundbreaking. And, and I think I really don't know if they knew what they were onto, but Simon and I live, lived in Annecy for, I lived there for a couple of years, Simon for four and a half. And it's not until you run down these uh, these pitched mountains that you really recognise that it takes its toll on the body, especially if you're running at a 10 to 12 degree drop. Uh, and, and, you know, when you're running down and you're feeling the, you know, this anterior knee pain and the lower back and everything else that's hurting, you, you think to yourself, how could we innovate our way around this through equipment to make the experience more comfortable? And I feel that's probably where, you know, where the idea was born. Like Simon said, there was a, a blend of these different innovations happening at the time. And it was, it was, it was pretty gutsy to go out there and, and obviously beat the drum about this this show. I don't know if you saw the first one, but it wasn't it wasn't something that was uh, uh, it wasn't the Mona Lisa, put it that way. And and it, <laughs> and and it would have been a hard sell. And it wasn't until someone experienced it. Um, yeah, it was great for all the short athletes out there as well, wasn't it? You know, everyone sort of pumped up a little bit all of a sudden. But but it also it just changed a few things, and I think it, it really opened up footwear innovation from that point on. Uh, that we could see some some real uh, some people that weren't afraid to have a crack, and um, you can see now that Hocker have just enabled that athlete that they accommodate for that athlete that likes to run five k's a few times a week here and there, just uh, leisurely, uh, right the way through to the performance um, focused athlete. I think it's uh, it's a really good story. It's an incredible story because the thing that blows me away about this is that the Clifton appeared on the market in two thousand eleven. So 10 years ago. So they've gone from nothing 
to a billion dollar company in 10 years with a shoe that's really ugly. Um, so have a think about that. You know, it took Nike, it took Nike 30 years to get any real traction. So it's, you know, it's really an amazing story. And and what that tells me is that you don't, you don't do that with, with blind, dumb, good luck. You know, there, there has to be, there has to be some real product innovation. There has to be some real value to the product um, for the consumer to support it in that way. And Simon, I'm not sure if you guys remember, but the Hoka had the patents on the maximalist uh, rocker bottom sort of midsole for a while. And there was, you know, around the footwear industry there was a little bit of innovation getting as close as they could to it without sort of pushing over that that space until those patents were obviously expired or uh, allowed more competition then you saw this influx of maximalist style midsoles that tried to compete in the same market yeah and the, and the really interesting thing is that none of the big boys really have product that are going head to head with it at all um which, which tells me they've kind of thrown in the towel and said right yeah, that's your niche you do that really well we're going to leave you alone because we don't we don't think we can make inroads into it, and that is very unique in the athletic footwear industry. The, it, it coincided with the death or the love affair, if you'd call it that, that many athletes runners had with minimalist shoes. It was almost like you had to start to let go of that uh, because even though that there may be no big competitors directly competing in that niche, I guess you'd say, or that that vertical of maximalist shoes as their number one priority. It, Every shoe seems to have added more stack height over the last five to six, seven years. Yeah, well, I guess we'll get on to we'll get on to Vibram in a, in a minute. But um, you know, I think that I think the key issue here, Brad, is that Vibram Five Fingers made a promise they couldn't keep, and Hoka have been very, very careful to not make any promises at all. They've never said our product is better. They've never said our product will do X, Y, and Z. Not ever have they said that. They've just said. They're big. We recognise they're not that attractive. They've got a huge stack height. That's what they are. But they've never, they've never said and they do X, Y, and Z. And so I think that's that's a really big difference between them and and what happened with uh, with the Five Fingers. It's also an interesting conversation to throw up while we've been discussing it. Is that um, stack drop and these types of numbers were really well defined in in traditional footwear and. Uh, conventional footwear and then Hoka came along and when you when you start to introduce a, a rocker bottom then you start to get those numbers being a bit blurred around the edges yeah the Hoka have got a four four millimeter drop but what does that mean when you incorporate a rocker and how does that four to four millimeter drop how, how is that used or how does that work with the stack height the drop's always a nonsense discussion because um you know obviously there's a thing called dynamic drop which means that if you're a 70 kilo, kilo runner um, and you're running on a uh, you know a four millimeter drop shoe. It's going to be very different than if you're 120 kilogram runner and you're running on uh, a four millimeter drop shoe because it's going to compress more. So so the whole discussion goes out the window. You're listening to Simon Bartold and Paul Griffin, sports podiatrists, on this expert edition, sharing their top five running shoe innovations over the last 20 years. If you're enjoying the Physical Performance Show, consider becoming a Patreon supporter of the show from just five US dollars per month, and we'll grant you complimentary access to our back catalogue of live stream events, including Dr. Stephen Siler, Dr. Shona Halson, and Rinnie McGregor, acclaimed UK-based sports dietitian. A massive thanks to this week's new show patron, Martin Shett. Thank you for your support. You can jump over to physicalperformanceshow.com and there you can stay up to date with our upcoming live stream events and jump on the newsletter list to receive updates and show notes for each of our episodes. For now, let's jump back with this week's Expert Edition guests, Paul Griffin and Simon Bartold of Bartold Clinical, sharing around the top five running shoe innovations over the last 20 years. Gentlemen, the nominated fourth best running shoe innovation over the last 20 years is the Under Armour Speedform Gemini. The comment on Instagram or the the caption was, in the sea of mediocrity, this shoe reset the clock for innovation when it was most needed. The result for the Gemini was a shoe with unique fit, comfort and performance characteristics. I just couldn't go past a shoe that had been designed in the factory that makes all the bras for Victoria's Secret models. I mean, that's innovation. So this was the first shoe that was actually built in its entirety outside of a footwear manufacturing factory. 
and it is a true story that it was built in a bra factory. And the reason for that is that bra factories are experts in form fitting, like they 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 they, they have all the knowledge. And so um, Under Armour went right right outside the zone and recognised this and said, "Radio, well, we're going to think about how we can." really change fit uh, in in the shoe but they, they went much further than that they had a seamless upper when nobody was doing that had an external heel counter when nobody was really thinking too much about that um, extremely high quality materials great attention to detail with fit and it was a shoe that completely slipped under the under the radar and it was quite interesting that when i was talking to the guys who um, <clears throat> developed the speedland product which is on our sort of near misses list um Dave Donbro and, and and Kevin Fallon, they both worked on the Speedform uh, Gemini project, and they both um, they both said they thought it was probably the best shoe that they had worked on, um, and they all worked they worked for Nike, for Puma, for Under Armour, so it really was very innovative. And and I made the comment that it was it came out when there was a sea of mediocrity. You know, everything was the same. You could you could throw a blanket across all the brands. They all looked the same. You know, Brooks had a version of Kayano. Kayano had a version of Brooks. Adidas had a version of Nike. And there was nothing happening. Uh, then suddenly you've got, um, a, you know, a, a brand that's really known more for its apparel um, come out and build this shoe. Um, for me, it's one of my personal favourite shoes of all time. I love that shoe. I think it really was innovative. What year did that drop, Simon? 2014 maybe what i like about um uh that story is it sort of put, it pulls back the layers on how we commence the innovation process in footwear and obviously with that product um there was a um some consumer insights that said okay well look the the, the foot um you know let's let's shoot for, for comfort let's shoot for something anatomical and uh let's let's make um, running as comfortable as possible. And, and the upper was something that had been largely neg- neglected by other companies, like you were saying. And, and I think that um, when you get a, a group of people working toward that common goal, of let's just well, obviously the foot's are massively exposed. It doesn't have much uh, flesh to protect on the, on, the, on the top of the foot. So the upper is something that would be, you know, if you get it right, you get it right. If you get it wrong, you get it really wrong. Um, and and I, I see what you're saying there with regards to how um, – you know, obviously using Regina Miracle and, and this um the 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 3D formation. Is it 3D forming? It is 3D forming, yeah. That 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 application would have um, you know, uh, unlimited potential in shoes for sure. Yeah, and I think it was it was very innovative because it really was the shoe that kicked off a trend that continues today. And that is um, in, in terms of footwear design, I, I think it's, it's a thing of great beauty and it's very simple when you look at it. You look at the shoe, it's very clean, it's very simple and that really started off a trend that very much got picked up by Nike. So Nike have very clean, very simple designs. Um, the design DNA is quite important. You look at it, there's nothing on the shoe that isn't actually telling a functional story and that really appeals to me. All this other stuff, you know, this is one of the reasons that minimalism got a foot minimalism got a foothold is that everything got too complicated. People didn't care about it, you know. All these logos and all this stuff that was put into a shoe to make it so heavy. Um, the the runner was just saying, I just don't know about this, I just don't need this stuff anymore. And and I think that was I think uh, I think Under Armour really broke the glass ceiling there. They they really did make a change that is enduring to twenty twenty one. So that, that's quite a big deal. Thank you, gentlemen. And then the fifth most innovative running shoe for the last two decades was the Vibram Five Finger Bicola Evo or Five Fingers. And we had to land here, of course, uh, with a conversation around minimalist shoes. But the caption was brilliant. My top fifth innovative running shoe caused a massive and much needed shakeup of an industry that was in cruise control and a complete innovation vacuum. Its effect was like dropping an atomic bomb on the mainstream, very traditional and very stale running shoe industry. That's why Vibram Five Fingers comes in with a top five ranking. Clinically, as you've already alluded to, gentlemen, uh, most runners had their head in the book, Born to Run, but by gosh, it, it really created a groundswell away from the traditional paradigm of motion control shoes. Yeah, look, this was this was the the sort of gathering of the perfect storm in um, 
in a, in a, you know 2010 2011 when this all happened so we had we had the convergence of Chris McDougall's book Born to Run with the publication of um, Dan Liebman, uh, his paper in Nature, uh, suggesting that uh, if you ran barefoot, then you would not have the same impact uh, occurring through your system. Um, and, and that, you know, almost overnight was accepted as being gospel, despite there being massive flaws with all of this, um, but it was accepted. And it was accepted by runners, I think, because they were just tired of the overcomplication. So they were looking for something different. So th the reason I put this there at number five is not necessarily because I like the shoe, um, because I think the shoe is very divisive, um, it's very polarising, but because of what it created. Um, and it, it left a, a lasting legacy to the industry that is incredibly positive. So it, it did actually do something very, very valuable for the industry. Um, I think for people who are listening, uh, it's quite important to understand that most running footwear is fit to purpose. The Vibram Five Fingers was fit to sailing, so it was designed as a, a shoe for yachting to um, give you a bit more grip on the uh, on the deck and to be waterproof. And then it morphed into a road running shoe because a bloke called Barefoot Ted, who liked to run barefoot, got in the ear of the CEO of Vibram, a bloke by the name of Tony Post, and said, I reckon you should turn the shoe into a running shoe. And that is literally how it happened. Um, so, and we all know, look, we all know the backstory to that. We know that there are a lot of issues with it. We know that there were promises made. We know that there was um, a class action against Vibram that was settled for more than 20 million US dollars. But by that time, they'd made so much money that they could just move on to other bigger, better things. And they're not the first company to do that, by the way. I don't, I don't really decry them that at all. But, um, you know, I think I think this is the whole thing we, we touched on, that in this industry um, it's a brave person who makes a promise you can't fulfil, and unfortunately that's what Vibram did. They said that it will prevent injuries and uh, it probably actually did the opposite because – it was only a very f select few people who could sustain this trend of running barefoot or running in a super minimalist shoe. It suited very few people, um, but it changed everything and, and every company had to pivot and, and look at, at how they were going to develop footwear from that moment forward. Yeah, it certainly did. Uh, anything you'd add there, Paul? Uh, I, I loved how um, how uh, a, a big part of the movement was that the footwear industry is a bit of a conspiracy and have got you sold on marketing and all the rest of it. And, you know, you don't want to support conventional footwear because, you know, it's responsible for injuries. There's been no change in injury rates since 1970, whatever. Uh, and they're like, you know, don't don't support that. And then they're like, well, uh, here, I've purchased these for 170 bucks. You know, that sort of, whereas it was a barefoot shoe, you could just run barefoot. But but uh, so there was this, this sort of marketing conspiracy thing that was underlying the whole purpose of it as well, um, which which I thought was really, really in interesting. Yeah, look, the, there was a lawsuit. Uh, I think it was 25, 26 million bucks uh, off the back of claiming that it was a, it was a, um, uh, you know, claiming that, you know, it would prevent injuries, which was demonstrated it wouldn't. It was a class action. Uh, but there was another class action sort of running around a similar time, wasn't there, with the Reebok body form shoe that, you know, that they sort of... Sketches, sketches shape up, which promised that you could have buns of steel and rock hard yeah, and that's while right. sitting in a chair eating a donut. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was that was always going to be an issue, uh, and I reckon they had more credibility than the um, <laughs> than the thing actually. But well, I did because they had Kim Kardashian endorsing it. So you've got a, a woman of no substance and value endorsing a product of no substance and value, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but but I think one thing um, that that I think this this entire space really brought about was you know the discussion surrounding form throughout running, and I think that. Um, there was then a flood of research into, say, barefoot running and barefoot running techniques, and majority is sort of looking at um, the the health benefits and, or you know, trying to focus on where where they can go with this with this paradigm, and um, ultimately it sort of led down the pathway of what is the correct way to run, um, and uh, I think that's been sort of really instrumental in how we're sort of not only developing, uh, say, I guess footwear, but training training um methodologies and 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 coaching um and and i guess working on the the best the, the positive or the strengths of physiological traits um 
so so it's, it's an emerging and evolving landscape as a result of uh, the barefoot um, barefoot shoe, I guess you can say, if it's such a thing, change in the industry. Yeah, I think it, the, a really interesting Paul, uh, points, Griffo. I think um, there, there are two there are two points to be made. Like it got called a barefoot shoe. There's no such thing as a barefoot shoe. You, you're either shod or you're barefoot, and, and there's no in between there. And it also spawned this discussion that Paul's talking about on natural running or or good running form. And I think we probably should comment on that and say, well, th- there is no such thing as best or, or perhaps even good running form um, because you, you, you learn to run at a very early age and it's kind of hardwired. And the purpose of it is to get you from point A to point B most economically and most efficiently. And it's extremely hard to unwire that, to change it. And and you, we could spend the next 15 minutes pulling athletes out that we know, you know, Rob De Costello, uh, um, Prisca Jet 2, you know, all, all of these athletes who have horrible running form but who are world champion marathoners or Olympic gold medalists who've somehow managed to do that by running really weirdly. Uh, and it would be a very brave person to change the way they ran unless they were injured and then you might have to change the way they run. But it did actually also, the other thing, the other gift that, that Vibram 5 Fingers brought to the table was for us to look at things like gait retraining. So can you can you have an injured athlete and look at how you might change certain gait parameters as a form of treatment? And that's a relatively new science for us. But the bottom line with Vibram 5 Fingers is here we are 10 years later, um, being subjected to an enormous amount of scrutiny and and we can't really identify any consistent benefit of that style of footwear unless you use it therapeutically. So as I said, if you want to look at somebody who's got recalcitrant knee pain, enter your knee pain and put them into minimalist footwear, that's sensible. Get them to do some judicious barefoot training, that's sensible. You might even, Brad, want to say, well, if we understand that loading is good for an injured Achilles tendon, you might even want to think about that as a way of loading the Achilles tendon. But you'd have to be right on it. You'd have to be very, very careful and monitor it very, very carefully. Um, but but it, it did bring a lot to the table, and, and I have a you know, deal of respect for that. Uh, it's just the way that uh, the, the argument got really nasty. You know, I mean, I, I got called some unmentionable names, I can tell you, and... Uh, it was it was pretty nasty. <laughs> Divisive, uh, maybe is the last in word there from that the Vibram legacy or Vibram legacy. Certainly, clinically, I'd echo your sentiment, Simon, that in Paul that it really did seem to bring to the table the conversation around gait retraining people with anterior knee pain running in minimalist shoes or experimenting with those. So I think there has been a legacy, and it's no surprise that it makes the top five, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for as always, so generously sharing here on the Physical Performance Show, but we can't let you uh, get away without issuing a physical challenge. You've done that consistently on your last two appearances. So what is the Bartold Clinical Physical Challenge going to be to listeners? The physical challenge is to purchase the most sustainable running shoe and compare your personal best time reflecting performance versus sustainability and see, uh, see the, the, compare those values. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. Well, I like that. That's good. That's a good one. My, mine's nowhere near as good as that. Mine's a lot simpler. My, <laughs> my physical challenge is for those of you who are running five days a week um, and, and are always on the same sort of route, I want you to um, vary that training and either stop running altogether and do something different like basketball or soccer or temp in bowling or – uh, get up and run in the hills for two out of the five days and report back to us on what if what if anything that has done for your training. No, that's fantastic, Simon, but I'll also quickly try on a joint Bartol clinical uh, physical challenge for the listeners, and that is you need to read uh, Born, the, uh, Born to Run, the book Born to Run, and you're not to tell anyone that you've read it, and that is almost impossible to do. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, and of course, the final set question is uh, deploying one piece of advice. Let's make it topic specific. So, what's one piece of advice you would issue to listeners around navigating running shoe innovations? 
Uh, well, for, for me, it would definitely be um, just just be cautious about buying into the whole super shoe thing. Um, I still view them as a racing shoe rather than a training shoe. Uh, that may that may prove to be incorrect, but um, I still think we should be showing a little bit of caution in relation to the wholesale adaption of that trend. Brilliant. Thank you, Simon. Paul? Uh, my thing is um, uh, be open to different uh, footwear innovations and uh, – uh, give them merit on their own exclusivity as far as what they what the innovations are trying to achieve uh, it may not suit certain stereotypes it may not suit certain individuals but we can all uh, celebrate the fact that we're trying to uh, make the experience of running um, better for everyone Simon Bartold, Paul Griffin, Bartold Clinical, thank you as always for your generous sharings and your contribution to the Physical Performance Show. Thanks, Brad. Been fantastic Thanks, Brad. to have a chat as always. Thanks, mate. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show and what a fun look at the last two decades of shoe material science, technologies and innovations. Thanks once again to Simon Bartold and Paul Griffin for their generous sharings. You can find the gentleman easily over on social media, Instagram at Bartold Clinical. They're a great follow for all things shoe sciences. And do jump back to episode 205, Carbon Plated Shoe Technology, and episode 153, A Running Shoe Masterclass, to hear more from Simon Bartold and Paul Griffin. Now, talking about socials, you can follow the show at Physical Performance Show over on Instagram. Consider taking a podsy. That's a screenshot of the episode that you're enjoying and tagging us in at Physical Performance Show. We'll reshare those, and we always love seeing those come through. So keep the podsies coming. You'll find video materials now over on our YouTube channel. Search The Physical Performance Show. And as Prime mentioned, you can now jump on The Physical Performance Show's newsletter for all live event updates and episode show notes. Jump over to physicalperformanceshow.com to subscribe. A big thanks to today's show supporters, Polar and Precision Fuel and Hydration. Another thanks to the team who make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin, show administration, and Matthew Olding, show graphic design. Now, coming up on next week's episode of The Physical Performance Show, we jump over for an expert edition with Professor Peter Eblin. Dr. Eblin is the chair of the board for Healthy Bones Australia, a world-leading endocrinologist and researcher and head of Department of Medicine at Monash University's Monash Health Centre. Professor Eblin will be sharing an expert edition around the very important topic of osteoporosis management and the management of low bone density in young athletes. Now, if you think this may not be an episode for you and you are an endurance athlete or a practitioner in the field, I highly recommend jumping on for next week's expert edition with Professor Peter Eblin. There are plenty of learnings coming your way. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer and this has been the Physical Performance Show.